Welcome to a instructional video on instance centers and centrodes. I'm Professor Norton from Worcester Polytech, and I'm going to give you a little demonstration with some models and some drawings to help you understand the concept of instance centers. Let's first provide a definition of what an instance center is. You see it on the screen. Uh, it's a point common to two bodies in plane motion, and that point has the same instantaneous velocity in each body. If we have n bodies moving in the plane, they will have c instant centers expressed by this equation. It's actually a combinatorics formula of n things taken two at a time. So it will be n times n minus 1 over 2. So if you had four bodies, i.e. a four bar linkage, then you would have six instant centers, 4 times 3 over 2. Another useful concept for finding instant centers is this so-called Kennedy-Aronhold rule. It was uh, discovered independently by those two men more than a century ago. And they discovered that if you have three bodies in plane motion, and incidentally, they don't even have to be attached to one another, just take three uh, pieces of paper and put them on top of one another and move them around on the table and you have three bodies in plane motion, they will have three instant centers. That's just a restatement of that formula because three times two over two is three. But here is the thing that they discovered. These three centers will lie on the same straight line and that's far from intuitively obvious. That was their contribution or one of their many contributions to kinematics. So I want to show you how to find the instant centers now with a four bar linkage example. So we'll get something similar to problems in the back of your book. Here we see a four bar linkage. Um, happens to have instant center one, two over here. Now the terminology I'm using is instant center followed by the numbers of the two links it joins. This would be link one connecting the two fixed pivots. So I would label this as instant center one, two. Now why do I call it that? Because it meets the definition of the instant center. It's a point that's common to two bodies, the two bodies being link one, which is in fact the paper, the ground plane and also common to link two. It's the pivot about which link two rotates with respect to link one. That makes it the so-called instant center. Now you might wonder why we call it an instant center since the definition says it instantaneously has the same velocity in two links. And in fact, this permanently has the same velocity in two links unless I take away the pin. Uh, so we also call that a permanent instant center. So I can actually find four of the six instant centers we know from the formula C is equal to N times N minus 1 over 2, and here N is 4, that we should have six instant centers in this particular case. Four of them are staring me in the face because they are the points at which the links are joined with pins. So this would be instant center 2, 3 in my notation, joining link 2 and link 3. This would be instant center 3, 4, by the same argument. And this over here would be instant center 1, 4, joining link 1 with link 4. Now that, whether I call that 1, 4 or 4, 1 is irrelevant because we're talking about combinations, not permutations. So I've gotten into the habit of just numbering them in ascending order, but that's not critical. Well, we found four of them, but three of them, uh, sorry, two of them still remain to be found. And that's where the Kennedy... Aronhold theorem comes in handy. And I'd also like to use some kind of a bookkeeping system to keep track of what I've found and what I need to find. And the easiest way to do that, I think, is to draw something called a graph. It's not a graph of the sort that you might normally think of in terms of a y versus x plot. It's a different sort of graph. It's actually a dual graph, D-U-A-L. And in a dual graph, in kinematics at least, lines become points and points become lines. That's the duality. It's an interchanging of lines and points. 
So the points that I just drew on the circle at roughly equal space, that's not critical to the exercise, represent the links, and I'm going to number them as such. So that point is link one. That's the dual of the link one. So line becomes point in the dual. This is link two, that point. This is link three, and this is link four. Now, just as lines become points in the dual, points become lines. So this line that I'm drawing between 1 and 2 on the graph, on the dual graph, represents instant center 1, 2. I'll so label it here. So that's I, 1, 2. A point has become a line. And by the same token, this is instant center 2, 3 in the dual. And over here is obviously instant center 1, uh, 3, 4, rather. And this is 1, 4 up here. So we'll label them as such. I one four. You don't really need to put these labels on. I'm just doing that for emphasis if this is the first time you're seeing this concept. But I wouldn't really bother to put those labels on because I can look at that line and say it connects 1 and 2, therefore it's instant center 1, 2. Now, the two that remain to be found are quite obvious from this dual graph. They are the lines connecting the points that are not yet connected, i.e. 1, 3, and 2, 4. So when I'm done with the dual, I have all possible interconnections from point to point, and each of those lines represents a instant center on the original picture, or the original linkage. Now here's where the Kennedy theorem comes in to help me find them. Kennedy's theorem says that three bodies in a plane will have exactly three instant centers, and they will lie on the same straight line. Any triplet here in the dual, i.e. a triangle, represents three instant centers. In this case, 1, 4, 1, 2, and 2, 4. Or, if you wish to look at this triangle, 1, 3, 1, 2, and 2, 3 make a triplet. And 1, 3, 1, 4, and 3, 4 also make a triplet. So that says, from Kennedy's rule, that instant center 1, 3 lies on a line that goes through 1, 2, and 2, 3. Instant centers 1, 2, and 2, 3. So if I draw that line on my diagram, here's instant center 1, 2, and here's 2, 3. So if I connect those dots, which they already are between those two points, but if I extend that line, essentially, it could go either north or south. I don't know yet where it belongs, so I'll draw it both ways. So now I've just extended that line. And I know from Kennedy's rule that instant center 1, 3 lies someplace on that line. Now, that doesn't really mean I found it yet, but if I have another line on which it must lie, then their intersection must be the instant center of interest. And going back to my dual, this instant center 1, 3 that I'm looking for, this line that represents a point on my original linkage, also is part of a triplet 1, 4, 3, 4, 1, 3. So it must lie on a line connecting 1, 4, and 3, 4. Well, there's 1, 4, and there's 3, 4. So if I draw that line and extend it until it intersects the other line, presto, there is instant center 1, 3. So I've just found that one. Now I can do the same thing for instant center 2, 4. I'm going to solid in this line to indicate that I found it. The dotted will indicate that I haven't yet done so. So now I'm looking for 2, 4, and the same approach works. 2, 4 is on a line that includes 2, 3, and 3, 4. Well, here's 2, 3, instant center 2, 3, and here's instant center 2, 4. So if I draw that line and extend it in some direction, I only have two choices. Extend it off to the west or down to the east here. I know that instant center 2, 4 lies somewhere on that line. And by the same token, it must lie on a line that contains 1, 2, and 1, 4. So we'll just draw that line. Here's 1, 2 over here, and here's 1, 4 over there. And draw that in a direction that's now obvious to intersect the other guy. And over here is instant center 2, 4. So there we have found all six instant centers of this linkage. Okay, let's go back to our uh, presentation here and look at the next example. In a pure pin-jointed four-bar linkage such as I just showed you, and such as is shown on this diagram, 
it's fairly straightforward to find the instant centers um, because we can obviously get the four pin joints, those four of them, and then we use the trick I just showed you with Kennedy's rule to find the other two. But when we have a linkage that looks like this, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself, this, this vector represents the velocity of instant center I3,4. And you know from your readings that the velocity of that point must be perpendicular to the radius to the center of that link's pivot. So we know that that velocity, as it's shown in this position, is horizontal, 90 degrees from the line from I3,4 down to I1,4. Now let's look at where this goes. This is a slider crank mechanism which you should be familiar with. This block moves in a straight line. Well, that straight line is, in fact, a flat arc. Going back to the picture on the left, if you imagine that you keep making this link four longer and longer and longer, then the arc through which its tip moves is going to get flatter and flatter and flatter. And eventually, when you get that length of link four to be infinite, then you will have a perfectly straight line here, will you not? Therefore, instant center 1, 4 in this instance is at infinity, but not just any old infinity. It's at infinity along a line which is perpendicular to the direction of velocity of instant center 3, 4. And that's the same as it was before. It's horizontal in both of these diagrams because I stopped this link 4 when it was vertical. So all I have to do is recognize the direction of the velocity of the point of interest, which is the point on the slider in this case, construct a perpendicular from it, and I could just as well argue that that line should go up to infinity above as opposed to infinity below. That doesn't matter. So I now have, in a, in a sense, found, in quotes, instant center 1, 4. A little hard to get my hands on it, but I know exactly where it should be. So I can now proceed to find the other two instance centers, there being four links here, I have six instance centers, by the same technique that we used for the pure pin-jointed linkage, having discerned that I know at least the direction in which to look for instance center 1, 4. So let's do an example of that. So here's a slider crank linkage of the sort we were just looking at a moment ago. And Let's proceed to find the six instant centers of this. Well, right away, I'm going to create my graph circle up here. And then I can tick off the ones as I find them. So I'll use this as a nice bookkeeping scheme. So again, I'll put my little dots on here that represent the physical links in my true linkage. Again, lines have become points. Now, as I find each of the instant centers, I'll tick it off here by drawing a line. Well, you should as easily as I be able to discern that this is now instant center 1, 2, because it's the point that pins link 2 to link 1. Link 1, of course, is the whole paper, right? So I found instant center 1, 2. In a 4-bar linkage, there should be four that are obvious, as long as you understand about the infinite locations of the slider's pivot. So that's going to be instant center 2, 3. So I've just found that guy. Now, this pin joint right here, you'll note, connects link 3 to link 4. And if I didn't even allow link 4 to slide left and right, and I just put my finger on it and stopped it from moving, and also cut 3 loose from 2, I could rotate link 3 about that pin on link 4. So that's one degree of freedom in that joint. So there is a pin joint here, and that's the point that has the same velocity in both 3 and 4. And as I just described to you uh, in the previous slide, in the PowerPoint, I can, by observation, detect that the velocity, well, I don't really know whether it's left or right at this point because I don't know what direction the crank is turning. But, so I don't know the sense of the vector, but it could be either left or right. So this is the velocity of I3,4. And by basic rules of kinematics, the velocity is perpendicular to the radius back to the center of rotation, whether that be a true permanent center or an instant center. So I'll just put an arrowhead up here. 
That's heading off to infinity. So I say I14 is at infinity. And it could just as well be up going up if you prefer to seek higher climbs. So I, th I sorry, I14, that would be at infinity in that direction as well. Okay, so now let's tick off what we found. I ran behind in my bookkeeping up here. So let's mark off that we've found 3, 4, and 1, 4. So I've got the four basic instance centers of this linkage found, and I'm now after the other two, 1, 3, uh, and 2, 4. Let's look for 1, 3 first. Same technique we used on the pure pin-jointed 4 bar. It's on a line connecting 1, 2, and 2, 3. Well, there's 1, 2, and there's 2, 3. So let's draw that line and extend it like so. And it's also on a line connecting 1, 4, and 3, 4. Well, here's 3, 4. And we know that 1, 4 is at infinity, either up or down. And I can see now that I put my graph right in the way of construction here. But I'm going to plow right through it anyway. I'm going to draw that line up there until I find instance center 1, 3, right up there. Now we're looking for 2, 4. Let's dot that in to indicate we're looking for it. So 2, 4 is going to be on a line connecting 2, 3, and 3, 4. Well, there's 2, 3, and there's 3, 4, so I can just extend link 3. Both directions, not yet knowing exactly where to go. So is the center 2, 4 is somewhere on that line, but it's also somewhere on the line connecting 1, 2 to 1, 4. Well, here's 1, 2 over here, and where's 1, 4? Well, 1, 4 is at infinity. But as I said before, it's not at any old infinity. It's at an infinity in a particular direction, and that direction is, by definition, perpendicular to the velocity of this point, which is instant center 3, 4. And if you recall from your high school geometry, I guess it would have been, all parallel lines intersect at infinity. So if I use another triangle here as a sort of a T-square, I can bring that line across parallel to the line heading off to instant center 1, 4. And I can say now that this line also goes to I, 1, 4 at infinity because this line is parallel to that line, and was it Euclid that told us that all parallel lines intersect at infinity? So here is my instance center 2, 4, and I see that I put my I, 2, 3 label in an inappropriate location, so let's re redo that over here so it doesn't look quite so messy and mislead you into thinking I, 2, 3 is someplace it isn't. So now we've found all six instant centers for this particular linkage. Uh, maybe a word about what the instant center means is, is appropriate here. I haven't really addressed that at all in this discussion. Uh, once I've found instant center 1, 3, for example, or any instant center, because of, of the definition being that it's a point uh, common to two links about which, um, which has the same velocity in each, uh, all points on link 1 have zero velocity in our world because it's the ground plane. We're considering it to be stationary. So if this point, I13, has the same velocity in link 1 as in link 3, and further, all points in link 1 have zero velocity, then it follows that this point is not moving. If that point is not moving, we can consider it to be an instantaneous pivot of link 3 with respect to the ground plane. And that enables us to very easily find the velocity of any point on link 3. For example, if this point, which is, by the way, part of link 3 and part of link 2, thus it's instant center 2, 3, if we impart a counterclockwise velocity 
angular velocity to length 2, then we can predict very easily that the velocity direction of that point A, which is part of length 2, will be perpendicular to the radius. And if I have a counterclockwise rotation, its sense will be up and to the left. The magnitude will come out of whatever the numbers are for omega 2 in that radius. But note also that this, this line, which is the same line up to instant center 1, 3, is also perpendicular to this, satisfying the basic kinematics that if this point A is pivoting about instant center 1, 3, as I just described, then its velocity in link 3 must also be perpendicular to that line. And in fact, it is the same velocity for both. It's the same point. Okay, I've beaten that to death sufficiently. So let's move on to another example. Let's look now at a more complicated problem, one in which we have what's referred to sometimes as a half joint. This is a cam and follower in a very schematic sense. So link 2, I'm calling the cam, and link 4, I'm calling the follower. And in your text, you'll find some discussion of effective or equivalent linkages. And that's the technique I'm using here. It's true that for an instantaneous position, I can substitute a pure pin jointed, all of this being in quotation marks, uh, four bar linkage for this apparently three bar link system. The three bars in question here are numbered one for the ground link, two for the cam, and four for the rocker. I've deliberately numbered them leaving out three because I'm sh going to show you how I can create an effective link three. Now to do that, I have to find the radius of curvature of the surfaces that are contacting at the interface, which is the half joint between the cam and the follower. And I've made this very simple to do in this example by postulating that the cam has a true radius right there. That, by the way, is a very inappropriate thing to do for a real cam, which you'll learn about in chapter 8. But we won't go there today. So if I find the radius, uh, center of the radius of curvature of that point at which it is touching the follower, and likewise the center of the radius of curvature of the follower, which is in fact a circle arc, then connect those two points together with a dotted line. I can call that the effective link 3. Now notice that when this moves to a new position by reason of rotating link 2, link 4 following along, then the length of link 3 will change. This makes the cam and follower a very flexible, no pun intended, linkage because it has variable length links. So it's, it's in fact doing a similar kind of task to that which a four bar, pure pin jointed four bar linkage would do, but it's not limited to its original link lengths. And I control the, those changes of effective link lengths by controlling the shapes of the cam primarily and possibly also the follower. That said, we can now find the, the instant centers as we did before by pretending that it's a four bar linkage. Now, Some other terminology is of, uh, of note here. When these two links touch, they will always have a common tangent and normal to that tangent they will have something referred to, not surprisingly, as the common normal. These also have other names. The common tangent is referred to as the axis of slip. It's the uh, direction of all slip motion. And the common normal is the axis of transmission, the line along which I can transmit information, energy, velocity, you name it, from one to the other. But it might be reasonable for you to ask, what are they good for? Why would you bother if even finding them in the first place? Well, I, I gave you some hint as to how they give you a quick way to visualize and estimate velocities of points on links, particularly if it's an instant center that involves the ground plane, because any of those that have a one in their pair of numbers is, in fact, not moving. And thus, I can consider the link to the moving link to be pivoting about the ground plane at that point. So that's very handy. It's a quick way to get an idea of velocities. Um, the links joined by the instant center have pure rotation between them then, which again makes it very simple to do the calculation. Now here's an example where had the engineers paid attention to the instant centers, I think they might have 
ended up with a little bit better design for the rear suspension of this famous or infamous, as you prefer, a Chevrolet Vega, which was made during the roughly the decade of the 1970s. This shows a cross-section of the rear suspension on one side. So here's the frame of the vehicle, front of the vehicle is to the left. Here's the rear tire, rear wheel, pivoted here, there's the tire. And as is common with uh, suspension systems, the, uh, the wheel or axle is carried on the coupler of a linkage, typically a four-bar linkage. So I've numbered them in that fashion. So the, the wheel backing plate is three, uh, link two is this rocker that goes back to a point on the frame, and link four likewise goes from this point back to the frame. So here the picture shows the car in a normal condition, uh, just sitting, not moving perhaps. And here we see the situation when the car is traversing a bump. And it's, it's quite possible that this bump is only on one side of the car. Perhaps it's a a lump in the pavement that doesn't extend across the entire lane. So imagine that one side of the car experiences this bump and the other does not. So the spring system not shown allows the wheel to move up within the fender well, hopefully keeping you and the frame fairly steady, uh, in in not, not even aware of the bump perhaps. But as the wheel goes up, note that the instant center 1-3, which you can find obviously by extending link 4 and link 2, and it being the pivot about which the center of the wheel is rotating vis-a-vis -vis the frame of the car. The frame here is my ground. It's a moving ground plane. Initially, the velocity is very close to vertical. But as it moves up over the bump, you'll notice that the instant center pulls in and goes somewhat down toward the ground, the true ground, the earth. And in the process, the velocity vector picks up a fairly substantial forward component. And what is a little harder to see, unless you compare the original drawing to the second one, is that there is an actual shift in position of the axle, in this case forward, as a result of it having lifted up over the bump because of the geometry of the linkage. Had the instant center 1-3 been, for example, at infinity, this would have gone straight up and down. And that's not impossible because if these two links were parallel, then you would in fact have uh, very close to vertical motion over at least the, the central portion of its motion. So the problem then is that an inappropriate choice of pivots and link lengths has resulted in an instant center that pulls in quite close and actually shifts the center of the wheel forward. This gave this car the nickname among some circles of hop along because just as with your little red wagon that you pulled as a kid, when you turn the axle of the little red wagon, it steers. So if you move this, say, the right rear wheel forward by an inch and the left rear wheel does not move in the same direction or distance, then you have changed the angle of the axle with respect to the axis of the car and you now have a rear wheel steering vehicle and it lurches for the ditch. If it's the left wheel that goes forward, it lurches into oncoming traffic. Not a very pleasant situation. Somewhere along the line, I think, and maybe in the 76 model year, they scrapped this entire suspension design and, and replaced it. But the car didn't last very much longer after that. Now let's talk about something called centrodes. The definition of a centrode is the locus of the instant center as it's reflected on one of the links of the pair, the pair being 1, 2, or 1, 3, etc. For instant center 1, 3, the locus reflected on the fixed link 1 is called the fixed centrode, and the same path reflected on to the moving link is called the moving centrode, which is to say that I can actually draw them on each of those links. This may become a little more obvious when we go to this picture. So here I show a four-bar linkage in three positions, here, here, and here for the crank. Actually, four positions. There's another one shown down here. So I have a total of four positions shown. And I can find the instant center 1, 3 for each of those positions essentially by extending link 2 and link 4. So for this position, instant center 1, 3 is here. And for this position, instant center 1, 3 is here. And I don't show them for the others, but you can get the idea. So as this link moves, a linkage moves through its range of motion, 
all these different positions of the instant center form a path which is called the centroid. Now I'm drawing that centroid on link 1 and thus it is in this case the fixed centroid because 1 is the fixed link. Now I can get the other guy by a simple trick of inversion. So if I take the same linkage, this is link 2, link 3, link 4, link 1, is link 2, link 3, link 4, link 1, but now I invert it which simply means that I ground a different link whereas before link 1 was grounded, now link 3 is grounded and I repeat the process again link, uh, sorry, instant center 1, 3 is at the extension of link 2 and link 4 in all positions, here it's shown two positions I've drawn this instant center and that creates this path which is the so-called moving centroid. Now let's show those together. So here I've, I have pictured the fixed centroid in black the linkage is shown in one position, ghosted in, to show instant center 1, 3 sitting at that point. And notice that the moving centroid, of course, is also touching and going through that point. But the moving centroid has a different shape, shown in red. As the linkage moves through its motions, the centroids, in effect, are rolling on one another with no slip. So I could actually throw the links away and cut out the moving centroid and cut out the fixed centroid out of some suitable materials, perhaps a metal of some sort. And if I could now, by some means, roll the moving centroid against the fixed centroid without any slip, and that's a, that's a difficult trick to do, uh, I would get the same motions, the same set of coupler curves. If you've seen the tape on coupler curves, you know what those are, um, for any point on link 3, which is the coupler. So I can actually generate the same couple of curves the linkage would have generated with no links if I have determined and created physically the centroids moving and fixed. So I'm going to try to demonstrate that to you with some cardboard models. We'll see how this goes. It's a little bit difficult to do this stuff in cardboard as opposed to metal because of the inaccuracies involved. But we'll give it a try. So here you see essentially the same diagram. This is in fact a figure in your textbook. I don't remember what the figure number is now. but So here's the picture we were just looking at on the other presentation of the links in various positions with two positions of instant centers drawn and the locus of the so-called fixed centroid which is the trace of instant center 1, 3 on the ground plane which is of course the, the paper in the background. And over here I've shown the inversion, link 3 being grounded, and the trace of the moving centroid. To give you a little bit of sense of how that works, I constructed this linkage of cardboard, and I extended the links. It's too bad these links aren't transparent. It'd be a bit easier to see that that point right there, if I can steal a pin here, if I prick a pin through there and take that away, that point that I just pricked is right on this, on this path. So one way to think of the generation of these centrodes is they're always at the point of crossing of the links 2 and 4 extended in this particular case, which I've represented by these cracks, uh, slices in the cardboard. So it's coming down to here, now it's hidden. Okay, so there's the locus of the instant center as reflected on link one. Now we come over here and do the inversion trick. So I have, these are exactly the same links. I've just chosen to pin now link three to the ground plane rather than link one. Now link one has now become a piece of cardboard. So I can do the same trick over here and I can move those around and I think you can visualize if you project the extension of these lines, which are links 2 and 4, respectively, extended, how they are generating that centroid. Okay? So there's my centroid generation process. Now I take those curves and I cut them out. 
and put the moving, uh, sorry, the fixed centroid there. And here is my moving centroid cut out of a piece of cardboard. Now, the little arrow that I drew there is the initial position. That's the, you can see the linkage um, since I used the same piece of paper to paste on the cardboard to do this. You can see where this is coming from. So I have to start that at the same point where it was touching. And this is the tricky part. Um, what, I, what I didn't point out to you before was if we put this linkage back on, let me back up a step. I forgot to show you something. I put a hole in link three right here. Let me get a sharper pencil. This hole is halfway along link three from one end to the other and right on that line. So that's a coupler point, right? And that will generate a coupler curve, which I can't draw very much of because I'm hitting my tacks up here. But I'm, I'm actually drawing that on the paper below. So when I take this away, you can see this little piece of the coupler curve right here. That would continue and go down here if I could get more motion out of my cardboard. So that's the, that's the path being generated by that point on link three. All right, now back to this. Here's my moving centroid, which purports to be link three, doing the same thing that it was doing when it had links attached to it. And I want to try to move that with my fingers such that it rolls without slipping on this interface against the fixed centroid. And I'm going to stick my pencil through that hole, which you'll see is in the same location as it was on the link, back and forth. I slipped at the very end. And I get, it's, it's a little bit off here, but it's very close to being on the same path. And, and the error, if any, is due to my crude cardboard cutting. So the point I want to make here is that you can have the same set of curves with no links if you can somehow cause the centros to roll on one another. And I'm going to show you another example of that in just a second. If we go back to our presentation over here. Before I show you the physical representation of it, I'm going to show you how you can see what the centros look like in program 4-bar. So I'm going to switch to program 4-bar at this point. And to do that, I've got to get out of this uh, PowerPoint and get 4-bar running. And now I think I have it ready. If you've used this program at all, this screen should look familiar to you. This is the home screen in 4-bar. So if I go to this screen right here, the input screen, I can calculate a linkage. And I can move it through. And I can see the coupler curve. And over here, I can turn on, I'm sorry, I've got to go next. I've got to go to the animate screen to do this. If I move to the animate screen, which looks very much like that input screen, I'm seeing the same image as, be, as before. But now what I was looking for is I have a little box over here where you can activate the centrodes. So now when I move this through, you'll start to see some points. Actually, if I run it, you'll see it a little bit better. These little dots, I think the black is the fixed centrode and the red is the moving centrode. So this is calculating and drawing the paths, which you can see are quite large in scope. They can actually go off to infinity depending upon the linkage geometry. Let me show you a different example, which will, I think, make it look a little bit better. If we take this Robert straight line linkage as an example, and we calculate that, and we move to the animate screen so we can turn on the centrodes. Let me first just move this through. This is one of the approximate straight line linkages. You can see now those two little circles moving around. Those are the centrodes. If I run this thing, I think we'll see the whole track of them. There we go. So that's not unlike the cardboard version I had a moment ago, where the black is the fixed centrode and the red is the moving centrode. So theoretically, if we cut out these curves and carefully and accurately in metal, and then also did the same for this red curve and rolled them together as I tried to do with the cardboard, we would generate the same coupler curve down here. 
to show you one other quick example. If you go to, I think the Shebyshev has one that's fairly easy to see, and we calculate that, go to animate, and run it. Here's the moving centrode, and here is the fixed centrode. Let me back this through a little more slowly. You can see this one is intersection of link 2 and link 4 projected on the ground plane instant center 1, 3, which is physically within the links in this case because it's a cross linkage. So that circle stays right with the linkages, and the red one that you see moving away is the projection on link 3, which would have come about if you inverted this linkage, pinned this link to ground, and let this link 1 be the moving link. So let's run that again so you can see it. This is also a straight line linkage. It's a better quality one than the Roberts. You get quite a good straight line out of this. And you can get that same straight line motion by cutting out these two surfaces and rolling this on it. And the this, this coupler point in question, in this case being right here, which is physically part of link 3, would generate the same straight line. Okay, that gives you a little idea as to how you can get these out of program 4 bar. Let's go back to the PowerPoint and... Uh, pick up where we left off. So, we've seen that the centrodes of links can be curves that go off to infinity, and that will be typically true of a Grashoff crank rocker type linkage. Um, Non-Grashoffs will tend to have more, more closed, or at least, uh, if not closed, more compact, I guess would be a more fair way to say it, centrodes. But if I take a double crank, this looks a little bit like that Chevy Chef we were just looking at, though it's not the same linkage. Uh, quite often, their um, centros will be closed loops. In this case, there's a double loop, sort of like a roller coaster that has a built-in loop-to-loop -loop in it. If we take a Grashoff special case, linkage, in which case the sum of the two short, shortest and longest and the other two links are equal rather than larger or smaller than one another. Uh, and this is the uh, so-called anti-parallelogram linkage. It's put together in a crossed mode. The centrodes of this particular linkage are true ellipses. And you will sometimes see these used as elliptical gears. And that's the example I want to show you in the last frame here. This is a pair of what are called non-circular gears. That's pretty obvious from their shape. And they are, in fact, centrodes of some unknown, at this point, four-bar linkage, a double crank type linkage. And they will give you the same kind of motion that you will get out of a double crank four-bar linkage. Now, I have that physical model right here. So I can demonstrate to you that despite the fact that it looks like it should not turn, it really does. So I will crank this through, and you can see that despite the weird shape of those gears, I do get continuous motion. You might reasonably wonder why anyone would bother to go to the trouble of making these strange shaped gears. Well, the motivation is to get a time-varying velocity on the output shaft. So if you assume that my hand is the motor and I'm trying very hard to go at constant speed with my hand, I'm putting a constant angular velocity or as close as I can into that input gear at the top and you watch the rotational velocity of the bottom gear and you'll see as that the head of the snowman comes through it slows down substantially because of the relative radius change between the driver and the driven gear. So I have a constantly changing gear ratio in effect. And that is very useful in such machinery as printing presses where you want to have a roller that ultimately speeds up and slows down within one revolution. And there are other applications as well in machinery where this is a quite handy kind of a device. So that should give you an idea that um, centrodes are in fact useful for something, in this case non-circular gears. We just did that. The last thing I want to talk about briefly is uh, cusps and centrodes, which you, um, cent centrodes you have just learned about. Cusps are discussed on uh, another video that uh, is in the set.
that deals with um, a couple of curves. And a cusp is a sharp point and a couple of curves. So here we see a wheel rolling on the ground. This could be your bicycle wheel, your automobile wheel, or a wheelbarrow wheel. It doesn't matter. And as that wheel rolls in contact with the ground with no slip, the point, a point on the wheel, um, forms a cycloidal path. And the wheel is, in fact, the moving centroid of a linkage, in quotes, and the ground is the fixed centroid. So you can then say that a wheel rolling on the ground is, in fact, a linkage in disguise. Another example of this cusp business is, well, better said, the, the relationship between uh, cusps and centroids is as follows. If I'm looking for a cusp on a coupler curve, I can find it very easily if I know where the centroids are. Because if I choose a point that is on the coupler and also coincident with the moving centroid, such as this, then it will, when that moving centroid rolls against the fixed centroid, which is not moving, it will come to zero velocity and give me the cusp-like motion, smooth deceleration to zero velocity and then acceleration away. So I can always find a cusp on a coupler curve by going to the moving centroid and selecting a point there. Finally, I'd like to point out this little example which I find interesting. You've all sat in a rocking chair at some time or other and you most likely have sat in both types of rocking chairs shown here. The rocking chair on the left is sometimes called a platform rocker. It's a physical pivot so it's really a dyad, two links, one pivoted against the other. This being, call it link one, call this link two, and some kind of a spring to support your weight. And when you rock back and forth in that chair, your head and every part of your body is in pure arc motion. I personally find that a very uncomfortable chair to rock in. On the other hand, this type of rocker, which is more traditional perhaps, which has some kind of a curved rail on the bottom, sometimes called a runner, um, I know this is a Boston rocker, having grown up in that city, but it probably has a different name in your region of the country, but I'm sure you've seen one. This curvature of the bottom runner is in fact a moving centroid, just as the rolling wheel is, and this floor is the fixed centroid. So when you rock back and forth on this rocker, you are actually sitting on the coupler of a four-bar linkage, the links of which have been removed, for, for the reason that you are rolling a moving centroid against a fixed centroid. And I personally find the motion much more comfortable in this rocking chair because if you've read about coupler curves or looked at the tape on that topic, you know that they are sixth-degree curves, whereas an arc is a second-degree curve. So this is a higher order motion, and that, I think, perhaps accounts for its uh, greater comfort or perhaps lesser discomfort than the other. So this, I think, is an interesting example of a four-bar linkage in disguise. No links present, but it is, in fact, the same kinematically as a four-bar linkage. So in summary, then, instant centers give us some insight to linkage motion. They provide a quick way to estimate velocities of links, and the details on that are in Chapter 6. And their paths called centroids provide some alternate ways to modify motion using what I call linkless linkages, such as non-circular gears, rolling devices, and whatnot. Thank you.